Hi everybody! My name's Patrick Martin, and I'm going to give you a brief rundown of recent Firebase updates designed to make your live ops lives easier. Now I probably don't need to tell you all this, but mobile gaming has come a long way since the early days. Initially, folks just tried to replicate the PC and console business model. Build a game, sell it, and move on, making your next hit. Repeat as you build up a catalog. Now, many folks tend to build games that are free to start, driving revenue through post-install monetization. This also means that it's often worth it to maintain and grow a game, developing your current community rather than searching for a new one every year or two. This is what I mean by live ops the continued investment you put into operating a live game to keep it fun, stable, and profitable. So Firebase has had live ops tools for years. A great example is Crashlytics. It may not be the first thing that comes to mind when many folks think of live ops, but it's probably one of the most important tools for running a live game. By that, I mean stability drives up game re revenue and retention. This should be intuitive, but if a game crashes on launch, you've probably lost that customer forever. Once your game, or worse, your brand is associated with being buggy, it becomes part of the zeitgeist. Gamers will start to say things like, that game looks cool, but that publisher is always buggy. Or, yeah, I tried that game on release, but it kept crashing. I probably wouldn't recommend checking it out. And don't forget that if you used fixed interval incentives, such as daily rewards or quests for checking in, an unexpected crash is the worst way to break the cycle. This is a long way of saying that from the very first moment your player experiences a crash in your game, you want it to be reported, you want to triage it, and when you have a fix, you want to know that it worked. You also want to be absolutely sure that by the end of your beta or soft launch period, you have everything running as smoothly as possible to avoid any day one bad reviews. So Crashlytics is a free integration with any Firebase product and can track crashes from the field amongst your actual live player base. It can aggregate crash reports, provide associated device metrics, and give you some baseline tools for figuring out what was happening at the time of the crash, and it's gotten much better in recent months. For example, we have worked hard to make Crashlytics one of the fastest and most reliable crash aggregation systems for mobile game developers. What does this mean? Let me give you a high level overview of the changes, but check out the complexity of NDK crash reporting for a full breakdown of how we achieve this. I wanna start with some features for C++ developers. The number one thing a C++ developer will want to know is whether this stack trace is from a release build. And there's a good reason for this. Compiler optimizations make every stack trace questionable. I've personally hit step next on a debugger and watched the debug indicator go back up a line rather than down to the next. I even had a C++ compiler put a divide by zero before the if statement that checked if a value was zero. Nothing really makes sense here. So Crashlytics has gotten really clever. I came up with a list of fun error cases such as templated code, const expert functions, and inline constructors. And in all of these cases, Crashlytics is able to figure out which line is breaking and symbolicate it. Take this function that's breaking in a bunch of functional code. It's parsing all these wacky templates, giving me accurate line numbers, and dropping me right into this fast divide function that broke. Just for this reason alone, I would add Crashlytics to my C++ project as a backup debugger and as a way to capture bug reports from my QA team running without being attached to LLDB. The rules around where to place symbols have also been relaxed. So if you have a custom build system or are integrating third-party pre-compiled libraries, you don't have to be super specific with your symbol file locations anymore. Now I can go on about C++ for days, but I know a lot of you are using the Unity game engine, so we have some Unity specific improvements as well. So first, I'd like to highlight that crashes aren't always simple coding issues. Games go through a lot of QA, testing, and often soft launches. The straightforward crashes have hopefully already been eliminated. 
but games tend to run up against the limits of users' hardware. Whether you're accidentally relying on an OpenGL extension that's not actually in the base spec, or are using an unsupported compressed texture format, or simply are using too much RAM for typical devices in a region. I've seen some of these in simple games where I was never worried about dropping below my minimum frame rate. These are the crashes that have you saying, why is that broken? Or that shouldn't happen. So you might run to your local phone dealership and pick up the phone or phones you see in a crash report. In some cases, maybe even your favorite secondhand electronics website. But these bugs aren't done with you yet. Some manufacturers even keep model names common in each market they sell in, but will swap out the CPU or GPU based on regional needs. It can really mess with you if you see where a crash is happening in the wild with a specific phone, but no amount of QA effort ever gets it to happen in-house on what you think is identical hardware. So Crashlytics has really drilled into game-specific use cases and evaluated developers' needs. With the latest SDK for Unity, detailed hardware metrics are sent up with every crash report. This includes the CPU and GPU your players have, driver versions, VRAM, and anything else that could help narrow in on the issue. This results in less time spent on reproducing the issue and more time fixing and verifying it. That isn't the only Unity-specific fix. We found that often a crash occurs in common engine code, even if it originates in user logic. This means that you might have several different issues in individual mono behaviors, but Crashlytics would group all of these into one bug report, since they all ended in the same bit of engine logic, leading to a frustrating game of bug whack-a-mole with your live players. In the worst case, a customer had literally all of their bugs listed in one report. And I know that this screenshot might be a little confusing, but notice that the crash is in Unity's native store provider. This probably isn't your actual bug since it's in the Unity engine. So the Crashlytics team has been studying Unity stack traces and generated custom heuristics for Unity-based workflows. This includes knowledge of Unity engine stack frames, so they can be excluded either above or below your game logic. This means that you'll see more crashes than before, but each issue in Crashlytics is actually a different issue that you can triage and resolve. In this case, it was smart enough to figure out that the user code was the Bingo Blast store manager and flag that appropriately. And with all of this, you're still getting real bugs from your players in the field as they happen. Combined with existing features like velocity alerts, you'll know about and hopefully fix issues before those dreaded one-star reviews really start rolling in. So I know that crash reporting isn't always what folks think of when they think live ops. What you really want to do is monitor your player behavior and react as rapidly as possible to your player's needs. Once you have a stable game, you want to be iterating on your game's unique feature set. In my first mobile games, I would just compile a binary and throw it over the fence to the various app stores. If I wanted to try out a new feature, I'd literally cook a new build, launch it, and just watch whether my app store rating went up or down. With app review times, this really took a while. And when you messed it up, it was really hard to roll back changes quickly. It was sometimes better to just abandon the game than deal with all this iteration. Now you might be saying, but I already used Firebase Remote Config to test out new changes, which is a great start. If you don't know what this is, you can categorize your players using audiences in Google Analytics and deliver specific configurations to some or all of the members in a group. These changes are efficiently synchronized over the air to live games as small JSON configuration flags. Client SDKs already handle all of the hard work, so you can just focus on defining what you want to configure. You might also already use Firebase AB testing. This lets you measure competing configurations among similar groups of users. It's a great way to see what your player community is tolerant of with respect to monetization or to experiment with new features or configurations within a subset of your players. This stack is great. If you have a user experience or a game design team looking for some optimal layout or trying to gauge the direction to go for your next update, you'll want to run an experiment and test the results. 
eventually promoting the best performing configuration to production. And all of this can occur between App Store releases, so you can iterate on your time. But some decisions are personal. Maybe you want to feature different in-app purchases per player type, dynamically tune difficulty, or just think different folks would like different color schemes. These are all decisions that come down to a coin flip, even after user testing. So we have Firebase personalization. This builds off of remote config and A-B testing, but leverages Google's AI expertise. Where A-B testing alone might find the best experience for a group, personalization can build a customized experience for every player in your game. To start, you define a remote config parameter to control and an event or events to optimize for. Events and parameters can be anything you think is important. Maybe you want to change the layout of your store or the frequency at which you show ads to drive up revenue. You could tune game difficulty, measuring session length or retention, or even when to show a rating dialog as measured by how often a player actually opts to provide a rating, as shown here. In this case, I have an experiment that tries to decide how many games I should wait for a player to complete before showing the Please Rate Our Game screen in order to get the player to actually leave a rating, in this case, one, four, or eight games. Once you start training a personalization, depending on your player base and how well-tuned your configurations are, it will take varying amounts of time to properly kick in, but you can often expect good results after 14 days. And remember that the AI model will constantly group and regroup your players, run experiments among small subsets of them, and tune the model automatically. This means that your game never stops optimizing as your players' preferences evolve. In a way, this becomes the most live version of live ops you could imagine. An AI monitoring your game 24-7 and ensuring that your game is always being the best version of itself for your players, even if your players have different personal preferences. Remember, this is a tool designed to augment your team's ability to test new features and react to a changing market, not to take away control. So at any point, you can check in on your personalization, swap out configurations that don't work, add new configurations to test, or just make a config the default if it's taken a clear lead. If you'd like to know more, check out Personalizing Your App in Real Time, powered by Firebase and ML also in the Google for Game Developer Summit. This will give you everything you need to know about how and where to use personalization. So to wrap up, since last year, we've made big improvements to Crashlytics. We capture more crashes than ever before with more useful data to help you get to the bottom of your issues wherever and whenever they occur. Then we revamped our live ops offering, creating a central location from which you can control and deploy game configurations to portions of your player base, allowing you to react to players in real time around the clock so your game can be the best version of itself. Remember that this was a brief overview of the new features. If these sound interesting to you, you should check out the complexity of NDK crash reporting and personalizing your app in real time powered by Firebase and ML. I hope y'all enjoy the rest of the Google for Game Developers Summit. This is a great time to really get to know what Google is doing for game developers. And you can always find me at Poxor on the Twitter. So long and have a wonderful time.